um, good afternoon everyone. Today I'm going to be talking a bit about discrimination in the delivery of healthcare and because it's quite broad I want to talk specifically about one aspect of that discrimination which is discrimination on the basis of gender. And there's sort of this term that's used in the media quite commonly, the gender health gap which is, um, you might have heard of the term gender pay gap and it's the same thing, it's essentially the idea that women receive a poorer quality of healthcare than men because of the fact that they're women. So instead of trying to define it, I thought I'd give you some examples. So the first example is endometriosis diagnosis. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically when the lining of your uterus, the same tissue, it starts to grow outside of your uterus and in like your fallopian tubes or your ovaries. And it's obviously very painful when the um, woman is on her period. And um, it's a debilitating condition. It really affects your quality of life. And it's estimated to affect one in 10 women globally. So based on that information, would anyone like to guess the average amount of time it takes to get a diagnosis? Two months. A lot higher. Oh. Two months. <laughs> Uh, no, more than eight months. Two years. Two years. More than two years. Uh -huh. What? Five years. Six years. Six years. Yeah, this closest. Six months. According to Endometriosis UK, it's seven and a half years. But depending on where you look, it can be like ten years. And for a lot of women, it will take a lot longer than that. They just want us to die. <laughs> and it's it's really bad because it's a really really painful condition. And you hear, you can see stories of women who have no painkillers, nothing will help them, and they just spend the whole day lying on the bathroom floor and crying because it's that painful. And there's no cure, and there's limited treatment options, and it takes this long to even get a diagnosis. And um, the second example is some more guessing. Go do a bit of diagnosis. So you're an any &E doctor, and a 70-year-old woman comes in. And she's complaining of neck pain, which is what guys really meant to be. I don't know, it's a bit too good. And nausea. So can anyone guess what she might be suffering from? Um, that's a good guess, but no. Anyone else? I promise it's not something super niche. It's quite common. You definitely have heard of it. Johan. No. <laughs> 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 um, now we should, we'll try this example. A 70-year-old man is coming to a &E. He has central crushing chest pain and possibly arm pain. It's very dramatic. He's struggling to breathe. Um, what do you think this could be? Heart attack. Heart attack. But the thing is, this woman also had a heart attack. <gasps> but because, um, firstly because we've seen a lot of media portrayal of old men having heart attacks, we know what it looks like. And the typical symptom is chest pain, arm pain. Um, but women are more likely to suffer atypical symptoms. And this can include neck pain, shoulder pain, sometimes nausea. Uh, sometimes it can just be tiredness and for them it will be it won't be dramatic all of a sudden it will maybe be over a couple of weeks and because heart attack is mainly seen as a man's disease which to some extent is valid because it affects men uh, twice as many men but um, heart attacks will actually kill twice as many women as breast cancer but we still don't consider it that seriously in women and if you consider the amount of time it took for you guys to guess, we got that one almost immediately, but no one was able to guess this one. So in that amount of time, um, the chances of survival have been reduced because delayed diagnosis means delayed treatment, and delayed treatment means you're less likely to survive it. And a lot of women, because they can't recognize their own symptoms, when they do survive and they're asked by their doctors, why didn't you come sooner? They'll be like, oh, I thought it was just a flu. I didn't think it was that serious. When in actual fact, it was life threatening. And the third example, which you might have heard of because it was, um, it's got more media attention in recent years, is autism and ADHD in girls. 
Three times as many boys, like in childhood, are diagnosed with autism. And most women with ADHD get a diagnosis in their late 30s or early 40s, which is incredibly late, considering ADHD will affect your life. And these conditions often come up here, so I put them together. And um, the reasons for this um, are debatable. Uh, a lot of research that's done into these conditions focus on firstly children, and then even as adults, they focus on men. In their trials and things, they don't look at women. And women and girls will learn to mask their symptoms, so they'll appear quite differently. And the reasons they might mask them is because of societal norms, the way that girls are meant to behave. They'll feel that pressure and then they'll mask their symptoms because they're not seen as normal. And um, because of that, they get a later diagnosis, which is quite unfair. <laughs> And here are some more Smart. statistics. <laughs> <laughs> Which I found quite surprising. Um, it's a well known fact that women live longer, but what we often don't consider is they spend 25% more of their lives in um, ill health. And 60% of women feel that a medical professional, a doctor or a nurse has dismissed their symptoms or told them that they're making them up. And because of this, 35% of women then avoid seeking medical attention in the future. 1% of medical research is focused on female specific diseases. And, which is, this one's quite shocking, uh, only 28% of women believe that the gender health gap actually exists, which I think is quite concerning because if you don't acknowledge the problem, you can't fix the problem. And 11% actually were asked and they believed that it was the other way around and men actually received worse care. Um, and just so we can be clear what we're talking about when we're talking about female diseases is um, general health conditions that might affect women differently and also gynecology um, related things, um, cancers that only affect women and all of these things that only affect women. And then there's also a lot of conditions. Um, they've mentioned Alzheimer's here, but there's so many that we haven't even studied the difference. So this is a very limited list. And um, this is, I mentioned about the funding. This is sort of a, how the funding is spread out. Obviously, it's only 1%. 1% uh, of funding for a group of people who make up 50% of the population is not great. And even then, it's focused on cancers which obviously we should be doing a lot of research into cancer because it's a very significant disease, but that doesn't mean we should be neglecting other conditions which affect people almost or just as much. And so why, why do I think this problem is such an issue? There's a list of reasons that are specific to the patients themselves, but there's also reasons that are broader than that. For the patient, it's suffering from these conditions, and then not being able to get a diagnosis, they're not being a cure, it really affects both their mental health and actually their self-worth. Because if you're told by a doctor consistently, your pain doesn't matter, or you're making it up, or it's not actually that serious, that's going to make you feel really bad about yourself. And obviously they have to live with chronic pain. Um, Every day of your life, day in, day out, you have to live with that condition and there's nothing anyone can do about it. So that's really going to affect your quality of life. And because you're suffering with this pain every day, it affects um, your job when you start working. So a lot of women can spend up to like nine days of their annual leave because of problems with like, women's health specifically. And because employers aren't aware of this issue, they often, they don't understand, they don't let women take the day off. And um, ultimately, a lot of women end up losing their job because they can't keep taking those days off. And quality of life obviously encapsulates all of these. And ultimately, you, women are going to be at an increased risk of death because the care that they receive is not of equal quality.
and for more broader reasons. Fixing the health gap would progress gender equality overall, which is obviously a good thing, and it would take pressure off the NHS because a lot of problems with diagnosis, there's a lot of back and forth, GP appointments, hospital appointments, different referrals, and just in general, finding treatments for these problems instead of trying to manage them, it would be more cost effective, and it would be really, really good to take the pressure off the NHS. And this one might be a bit surprising, but it's estimated that fixing the gender health gap could boost the global economy by up to $1 trillion, which is not a small amount of money, so it is something that's worth investing in. So, for the reasons why there is a gap, there are so many reasons, but I picked out some. The first really big one that we need to fix is insufficient knowledge. Just the fact that we couldn't recognize those heart attack symptoms is because there just isn't enough research into how do diseases affect women differently, how do their hormones and their metabolism differ. Um, and part of this reason is because the FDA ruled that women of childbearing age should not participate in medical trials. So all these drugs, all these treatments, they're trialed on men, they're not so much trialed on women. And um, they had good reason for that, because I'm sure you've heard of the thalidomide scandal, where um, taking that medicine caused birth defects in um, uh, the children of pregnant women who took that. And because they didn't want that to happen again, they were like, women who are of age to have children, they shouldn't take part in the medical trials just to eliminate the risk. But obviously that logic is flawed because now we don't know what effect that would have on these women. And they make up a significant proportion of the um, population. And it's not just with drugs and dosage, it's also designs for implants. Like hip implants are twice as likely to fail in women because obviously their bodies are shaped differently, so they bear load differently. But when hip implants are designed, they don't actually consider that. The same implant for men, they'll give to women, and they're obviously not going to work. And then the second reason is sort of a societal reason. Like I mentioned before about women having their pain dismissed, or being told that it's not an actual symptom, they're just being emotional. Um, and obviously bias in general not taking women as seriously and also because a lot of women's health topics are considered taboo they're not talked about as openly which affects the healthcare as well and the last one is it's less applicable in the uk because we have an nhs still but um it's still important because the nhs does turn to private providers and the thing with these insurance providers is they always pick out the most prof profitable treatments and they choose to only provide those. And for some reason, they don't consider women's treatments to be as profitable. So they don't invest money in developing those services and those services aren't gonna be as good quality or as widely available. And because of this, the women who need them are going to suffer. And so we've looked at what causes them. So now how can we fix the problem? So the first one is obviously fixing the knowledge gap. We need to start um, doing more research into the conditions, start including women in medical trials, and um, just uh, make a conscious effort to fill that gap in knowledge. Um, the, thing, the good thing is we have a lot of the technology that we can use for treating these um, issues because we've been developing in oncology and immunology and a lot of that same technology we can take and we can apply to these can women's health issues and it's it wouldn't be as expensive because we already have the technology we just need to invest the time and attention into it um, obviously we've talked about investment one percent is too small of a value that needs to go up and awareness among the general public and also awareness among medical staff. They need to be trained better to be more aware of um, the symptoms of these conditions and also to not dismiss any of these conditions because that, has a, that is a big part of the issue. 
and that's it. Thank you for listening.